Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you got a chance to get some food in. Uh, how's it feel to be in London? <laughs> Man, London was better, Dave Reebok, uh, in February than New York is in the first week of March. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the, really the second day of a phenomenal event. Um, yesterday, we had our RG Symposium, which was very well attended. You were there. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of the commentary you're going to hear earlier today, later today, today, <laughs> and tomorrow is going to be focused on that. We have uh, three re really great uh, panel members. Uh, next to me is a dear friend, uh, professor uh, foremost at Seton Hall University Law School, my alma mater. He taught my 30-year-old BP4 uh, in law school. He's the vice president and chief compliance officer for a phenomenal brand, uh, Penn Entertainment. Please join with me in welcoming Chris Soriano. Thank you. And next to uh, Christopher is uh, the VP for legal at Rush Street Interactive, a great company. We know it well. We do a lot of work with uh, her colleagues for many, many years. Nancy Ramirez Ayala. And our final panel member, Katie Lever, uh, was not able to make it. She had some flight issues. Uh, but uh, Vladimir Jovanovic uh, is the COO of SB22 with offices uh, in Europe and Las Vegas. Correct. Welcome, Vlad. So we're here to talk about the usage of data, the importance of data with operators. So I'm going to kick it to you first, Professor Soriano. Um, a, why is data important to your company and to operators in general? Yeah, thanks, Bill, and, and thanks, everyone, for, for being here today. Uh, we look at data, obviously, on the, on the compliance side of the house. I think, um, you know, I think we probably all have a little bit different perspective here in terms of how we use data, so I'll, I'll start from the compliance side of the house. We obviously have many obligations when it comes to, A, assuring integrity, B, ensuring compliance with anti-money laundering requirements and controls. Um, you know, when you look at all of that, you know, and, and of course, on top of it, add the use of data in responsible gaming, uh, I think you look at this ecosystem of now that we're in the online space, we have a lot of available data to us about what's going on. The question, I think, becomes, how do you mobilize that data? How do you use that data to make sure that you're taking a good look at what's going on and how do you then incorporate the latest data tools into a compliance program? You know, keeping in mind, um, we're still dealing with, when we talk about using data in AML, I mean, we're still t dealing with the Bank Secrecy Act, which is dated um, and was not written for a world of online sports betting. Um, we're dealing with BSA regs that don't necessarily fit into the box of online sports betting. So, so how do we take these you know, 2024 and beyond data tools um, and look at it in terms of fitting that paradigm into the old land-based casino regulatory model that still exists from a BSA perspective? So I, I think that's um, the future is bright in terms of how we use data, but I think we're all still trying to wrap our heads around, particularly on the AML side, how do we take that data and make it as useful as possible? Nancy. So I think data, what operators want is they want clean data and value-driven data that is useful for creating a competitive advantage. And what I mean by clean data, I mean data that is collected, used, even shared in compliance with <coughs> privacy laws. And, um, you know, specifically uh, those revolving around consent, those around legitimate purpose, and those around um, data min minimization principles. And then with respect to value-driven data, I think it's important to sort of understand that the sports betting industry is starting to mature. And um, we're not in that... Uh, Operators aren't solely interested in personal data or new players simply at that acquisition phase anymore. I think what we are looking at is really 
data analytics that can really be used for CRM purposes, for retention, for engagement, for creating that, for really optimizing communications and being able to um, really maximize player satisfaction. So that's where I'm seeing sort of our data usage. Nancy, um, for you first and then Chris, and Vlad, I'll get to you because you have a total different expertise and perspective, and rightfully so. Nancy, a lot of folks uh, for the past several years, if, if not longer, have been talking about black market versus your company and Chris's who are totally white label, legal, licensed, regulated, compliance driven. What, what's the difference between an operator in a black market and an operator in a legal, regulated, and licensed market in terms of data? Well, I think, well, trust, customer trust. And I think that being able to um, address those consents, being able to make sure that the data that you're, that you're giving, a play, when players is giving over their data, they're, it's going to be used ethically. It's, um, it's, it's that whole customer trust perspective, I think, that's the difference between the two. Yeah, and if I could add to that, Bill, it's, it's a great point, Nancy. I think the other aspect that you know, we look at is I can use the data that I have on any given event, any given customer, any given situation, and get that data to law enforcement, to regulators, to others to assist in any sort of issue that they may be looking at, which, coming back to what Nancy says, creates an environment of trust in that you know, we can certainly turn that over. Um, if something nefarious is happening on an illegal market that an illegal operator is offering, um, there's no incentive for that illegal operator to go um, to the Division of Gaming Enforcement or the FBI and say, hey, look, I'm operating illegally, but I have this data that shows that somebody else might be using my site to also operate illegally. Like, it doesn't, you but, know? But, but do you think the black market operators are using that data to provide consumer protection? No, no. <laughs> no, I, I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, I, as, as, you know, uh, privileged operators, we have to comply with the privacy laws in all the jurisdictions where we operate. And so when we are collecting data or sharing it with third parties or even using it, um, you know, we're required to comply with cybersecurity laws. We're required to comply with certain security standards. We're required to comply with privacy laws in, in, in a way that obviously the others don't have to. Vlad, let's talk about the tech stack. Yeah, uh, the, the definition of data is changing. Uh, so what, what we collected earlier was, uh, you know, email addresses or before that even mailing addresses and then we wanted phone numbers. But now we're collecting much more. We can collect much more. And you, you addressed the question about what can be done. A lot can be done. Uh, this watch collects my pulse, my heartbeat, am I excited or not? Uh, this, uh, if, I'm, if I'm in a VR, it collects my eye movements, what I'm looking at, am I, ex am I interested in BMW or Mercedes? All that stuff is data. How you use it is the key. So illegal operators might be using it for, uh, to, attract, to attack somebody who's vulnerable, whereas legal operators will try to protect a vulnerable person. If somebody has issues with gambling addiction or something, you could recognize that very quickly with the amount of data we're collecting, and you can address that. Illegal operator will go the other way around. They will, they will bleed them dry as long as they can. So it's, uh, you will probably address it in a better way from, from a legal perspective, but we can do much more with the new tech right now, this year, next year. Apple Vision Pro knows all of your eye movements. So knows what you're looking at, knows what you want before you know it. Talk about that, Vlad. What's, what's the future look like in terms of data and what it can do for operators and for the customer experience? So for us, what, what, what we're focusing on is to automate things. So you, you, you collect data to automate things. You collect data to uh, give customer a better experience. So if I'm betting basketball and you like NFL, my app should know that, right? And so when I, when I open my app, it should give me something quickly. I don't want to be logging in, finding, and so on and so forth. That can be used for that. Uh, promotions. Um, customization of any kind of bonuses and everything else, minimizing the cost to the operator, maximizing the return and the value to the player. If you give me $10,000 to bet on cricket, I wouldn't know where to start. 
because I don't know anything about cricket, but if you give me $5 to bet on basketball, I can go there. So that kind of differentiation, as long as it's automated, can be powerful for the operators. Now, Nancy and Chris, if you would please share with us your thoughts on, you brought it up, Nancy, on data privacy, personal privacy, security. Um, we know that America is made up of 50 different jurisdictions for the most part, not all of them have gaming, but, but it's very different than the European data privacy rules, right? It's, some would say it's more intense. Uh, some would say it's not as intense as the UK. To talk about that, what you're dealing with on a regular basis in terms of securing the data and data privacy for your customers. I think it's challenging if you try to, if, if you wait for laws to come into effect. And I think it's challenging if you try to specifically only address that laws that, that affect you. I think you need to have a, a better approach. I think you need to have better policies in place and, and working with technology teams, working with operations, working with your engineers and your developers and your customer service team, and really to understand how they're going to use this data and develop some... Um, addressing the principles behind the laws as opposed to the laws because we've been operating uh, you know, in the sports betting space for a while and now laws are trying to come into effect. So you're always going to play catch up if you sort of try to take that approach. So I think it's best to, to kind of address the policies and the principles behind privacy and data protection and then try to get a little granular in those jurisdictions where you might need to be able to do that. Otherwise, you're always going to be playing catch up. And I think that's how we also need to approach um, AI governance, really developing a AI governance frame, um, framework that's uh, addressing responsible AI and not just the laws that might be coming, um, uh, but really sort of those high-risk areas of bias and accuracy and transparency. Otherwise, you're going to just sort of get behind and always trying to play catch-up. And we know that, that customers and um, lawmakers are intensely scrutinizing organizational data usage and the privacy concerns around AI. So it's important to sort of get ahead of that, of, uh, of what's eventually coming. Yeah, one, one of the things I've been happy with um, in terms of on, on the regulatory side from, from a data privacy perspective is the way US gaming regulators have been engaging with stakeholders to take a measured approach in terms of what the regs should look like as applied to operators. Um, I, it's been, you know, a number of states have done it publicly, a number of other states have done it through the regulatory comment process, et cetera. Um, Regulators' doors have been very open to understanding what it is that the industry can and can't do, what other requirements, such as federal laws, that, that we also have to live by, and trying to find a way to make all of that come together. It's, it's really been a, a, a very collaborative process um, so far, and I, I think... Um, I was hoping we would get through this without having to worry about, uh, without having to think about AI, but here we are. Here we are. Um, I think when, you know, as we start looking at the impact of all sorts of different AI on what we do on the regulated sports wagering side, and, and you know, my mind immediately goes to what are the potential nefarious purposes that you might see. Um, I hope we can continue to all have those, those collaborative discussions about, you know, what's the best way to do this? You know, when we talk about the benefits of the regulated market bill, it's, it's all of us on the regulated side, the operators, the suppliers, the regulators versus the bad actors. We're all in it together on, on this kind of stuff. So I think, um, we need to keep that in mind as, as we confront the existing data privacy issues and then as we think about generations of AI that are coming down the pike. Vlad? Yeah, I mean, uh, what people call, call AI these days, it existed a long time ago with different, in different names. Uh, but uh, the first one, for example, face recognition, right? We all use it. Uh, we use it in our kiosk to recognize players, to adapt, to, to enforce the AML process, for example. Uh, 
can can it be used in the other way? Of course. And then on the on the other hand, what what I'm interested in, what what we are looking um, is how you control, how you make sure you control the data, how the data is not leaked, how the data is secure in your servers. What is the minimum of the data that you need to collect in order for for you have to have the effect without obviously storing people's life on your servers? But the biggest companies around us, Google, Apple, they all do much, much more. They all collect much more data than we do. And then the question is, what's, what's coming next? Like, how are they going to use it? How, who's going to stop Apple, uh, you know, opening their Apple bat? They, they have a, uh, what, what's called a Apple Sports, right, with odds inside. Next step, you know, they, you might be able to bet there. They get a license. Who has the most data? I guess is the is the is the question. How you make sure that your that your players are protected in your ecosystem, where everybody else is collecting their data, and how do you how do you secure that? Obviously through a I, I, I'm a technologist, so I would do it through technology, through 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 better, better uh, technological tools. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 all about it's all about the con controlling of the data, making sure sure that you not did not unintentionally collect something that whatever you collected is a minimal viable thing, and then, if possible, not storing it because right now we can be we, we are we are training models, and then I don't need, need the data anymore. Once once I train a model, for example, let's let's say I I have you as a player. And on my app, and I'll train my model to know what it's, what you like, when, when, when you're at work, when you're at home, and so on and so forth. Once I have that, I don't need that data anymore. But how often do you have to update that? And that's a good question. It depends on how difficult it is to train your model. So if, if it's a fairly, it's a fairly um, limited amount of, of, of uh, like, Generic models take a millions to train, but models that, that, that are running on, on our smaller set of data are fairly cheap to train. So probably once a week, and then I can delete it. Uh, so I, I just have to, to add the delta between the previous one and, 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 and what, what happened this week. So if you change your job, or if you change your sleep patterns, or whatever, whatever we decide to collect, obviously, uh, we'll add it to that model, and then I don't need to store the data anymore. So if somebody hacks the server, they will not find anything the, no, no PI data about you. It's just a model that works in our system. So, so your cybersecurity council is excited. <laughs> <laughs> you say, <laughs> I'm only giving it for a week. <laughs> it's 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 about well, uh, again, uh, but. Uh, if, if you cannot, so, so if, if if I make a model of your face, right, which is which cannot be reversed to find your face, mm. right? So if, if that leaks, who who can use that? Yeah. Nobody really, because it's it's my hash, it's my algorithm. It's it's useless to to to, to hack. If but if I store a picture, it's a different different story. So I don't want to store a picture. That's that's kind of where we make a, make a difference. Yeah. So so real quick, that I, I'm glad you brought that up, but I want to just tee it up for a second. I haven't talked that much, Chris. You're good. Shocked. Doing good. No, not at all. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Early on, when we launched in the U.S. and obviously New Jersey, uh, was the first mover. Clients, predominantly from abroad didn't understand that you could have a call center outside the state, but PI could not move across state lines, okay? Now, I believe, and I've tried to educate clients and others, that that's done for security purposes, and, but what's the logic behind that? Because you have a reputable company, Nancy's with a reputable company, certainly Vlad is, but how do you know that somebody in your office isn't just kicking that information out the door to somebody else? What are the internal controls that you and Nancy have to deal with on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, to start on that, Bill, without getting, obviously without getting too into, uh, into the security. Look, I think having a strong overall controlled environment where, A, you're, you know, and, and one of the reasons why you want to control who access, has access to that information is because you start from the premise that New Jersey follows, which is folks who have access to that information have to be licensed. So now we know who those people are. They've demonstrated their suitability. Okay, that adds a level of trust. If you have a good control environment in place where you're training um, and you're educating folks on what the controls are over that data, that adds a second layer of trust. If you have a robust audit function that is then auditing what's going on with that data, that adds a third level of trust. Like I think it, there's no one piece of the puzzle that works, but all of those components have to work together. But when you're when you're licensing, when you know, the regulators are licensing the employees, you're trying to make sure that you don't have bad actors. 
you're constantly evaluating your controls, you have good cybersecurity, and you have good audits. I think if you put all of that together, you're doing what you can. There's, and look, I think we've all, you know, anybody out on the operator side or others, you've seen it, you occasionally get the lone wolf who just doesn't follow processes. And there's stories about them in the industry. You try to have as best controls in place as you can to stop that. Um, it occasionally happens. You know, you do, you do see it. I mean, That's why you'll see it in most most contracts. You need your technical, your administrative, and your, all your co contractual measures in place. So those are kind of the three areas that hopefully build upon each other. And not, each other. nothing is perfect, as as you mentioned. You 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 do all of these measures. You you can only do as much as you can do. Um, Again, from technological perspective, try to try to follow the latest practices of storing the data, of minimizing the access, of separating separating different types of data in different uh, entities, which cannot not so the single person cannot kind of get your uh, your credit card number and your PIN, right? Uh, you, you separate those data, data um, analytics is such that that you can separate such data. So it, if part of it somehow gets away, it's not as useful as, as the whole of it. So you, you would not store the same one person's, all of the, you know, about one person in the same kind of database schema that can be accessed by one, one guy. Vlad, you're and, getting and data. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nance. Oh, I was to say, because there is going to eventually, potentially be a, a, a breach, then you need to have a good incident response plan oh, in place. <laughs> That's <laughs> crucial. So, so you're getting, let's call it primary data from the operator. Yeah. They tell you what the end game is, what they're looking for. You then engineer it and get it back to them. So I would imagine that that's through secure portals. Cyber breaches are very unlikely, right? Very unlikely, but they've happened. We've, we've seen it just last August in yeah. a couple of casinos in Vegas uh, and then across the country. But as a consumer, shouldn't I be concerned about you grabbing my data and kicking it across state lines to another company like yours, an engineering company, and what, what could be done with that? Uh, well, again, first, there's no in incentive for me to do it, obviously, uh, because, because getting caught in that kind of shenanigans will, will <laughs> it ha have an issue. Obviously, in a, in a, we, we have to distinguish between U.S., which is very, very, I would say, over-regulated market versus everybody else, because none of the... Uh, guys in Caribbean or wherever they are will will even think about it. They will like, yeah, give me everything and I'll then I'll sell it to the other guy, right? But that's not what we do. We try to protect our customers. We, we try to protect whatever they tell us to 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 have, and we try to have as as little as possible of the data at any time on our servers. So so that that's that's how you protect yourself from becoming a target. If there's a database of all your credit cards with pins, I mean, you cannot protect the database. The there's no Unpenetratable system. There's no such thing. If, if with enough resources, you can penetrate any system. The, the problem is you, what you gain when you get it. If you, if you go in and there's nothing inside, if it's an empty vault, right, then nobody wants to get into that bank. If that vault contains billion dollars, then everybody wants to get in. You cannot save it. It's just, it's just how it is. This is shocking. Anna. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in thanking Vladimir, Nancy, and Chris. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.